There was a quiz with each class, which was a really well thought out quiz that involved a lot of research and thought. It was not just multiple choice questions. There were visual quiz that kind of were directed toward helping people prepare for being at a plant clinic. Um, so that was kind of the way it was then. Um, and I'll just add that in 2020, because of the pandemic and we, we had finished almost all of our classes, we, we just had the last class, which was the experiment class, experiential class of <clears throat> interns um, training for the actual plant clinics. And we did that online. <clears throat> But we made the decision not to accept any new interns for 2021. So our 75 interns that you, that Karen mentioned really are divided among the classes that, so two classes of, of, of interns. We didn't enter a first year class of interns. And because we couldn't get all the service hours for 250 master gardeners, Adria allowed us to have two years to get our 24 hours each year. So that's 48 hours. So we're now facing in our system, a, a number of people who really need to get lots and lots of service hours to make up for the lack of service hours in 2020. Yes, but you have that well okay. underway. <laughs> Thank you. Karen. Okay, um, let's talk about the syllabus now. It's, um, I would say that one of the things people look forward to are what are the classes we're going to have. Um, David Yost is one of our, he's an emeritus member and he is the one who chooses our speakers. He has lots of connections. He, he um, selects them to cover most of the topics that we're expected to cover. And often he says he has directed them toward, you know, information to help people learn to, uh, for, for training uh, plant clinics. So um, this is, should I go into any of this, Anne, do you think? I don't think so. Have a look. Yeah, I, because we're, we're going to give some examples of okay. how we use Canvas um, at the end of the, during the last part of the conversation, so. Okay, so this was the syllabus that we were going to build our program around. So when Karen gave me this syllabus to load into Canvas, um, she also gave me some supporting documentation under each of the classes. So she had done a lot of work identifying what the additional materials, what the modules and, and, and other supporting information. And we developed quizzes. We used the, some of the state quizzes, but we also developed quizzes on our own. So this syllabus became our organizational theme for Canvas. And we organized each, the Canvas modules around each one of these 11 um, there's a module for each one of these 11 classes. Okay, so there were having had to change. I mean, we considered them at first challenges, but then you could think of them differently. And um, in solving them, we saw them as opportunities for change, um, positive change. So one of the choice, one of the problems was what, how do we do present a speaker if we're going to have this person only once um, for in one time during the day, virtually uh, for one and a half hours. So uh, how did we just decide whether it would be the AM or PM class? Um, that was left up to the membership. There was a vote taken and it turned out that um, we would alternate um, between morning and evening classes. Uh, I think a lot of people voted 
to help out realizing that there were a lot of issues for people who could not come in the morning and um, actually for both. So the alternating classes were good, um, a good solution. And uh, so that was also, that helped out the uh, students who work, who had, uh, they were working from home, but they were still working. And there were lots of people who were um, homeschooling their children, who had care, were care, caregiver responsibilities, all of those things needed to be considered. So um, the solution was that we would record the Zoom session, which we'd always recorded anyway. It would be recorded and uploaded to Canvas to join the module. So, um, so Zoom became our class platform and um, it, David took it as a real opportunity that to get some speakers that wouldn't have been possible to acquire before because of the distance, their reluctance to come and stay overnight and do two, speak, uh, two lectures. Uh, some were very expensive, but less, uh, more affordable when they were going to be uh, speaking on, online. So that was um, one of the opportunities. So the reason it was decided to have a one and a half hour lecture was that a lot of people are Zooming all day long and there's a lot of Zoom fatigue. It was just decided in the, um, our board meeting <clears throat> or the group who was deciding on things um, that Zoom fatigue sort of set in after an hour and a half. But that left us with three hours, I mean, one and a half hours to make up our three hours that we used to get for just going to class. So that was going to be, um, we would call it self-study. And how is that going to look? Um, <clears throat> before, our, most of our self-study was the manual, the um, handbook that we get. And that's really super. But other educational options seem to be um, um, something that we needed to add. It was just kind of one and a half hours of, of, for reading the manual. We'd done that a lot. So uh, what happens next? Uh, okay, oh, so we'll, talk, we'll show some of the things that we added later. Um, so how do we verify it? How are we going to verify attendance at a live class? Well, Anne had that answer at right off the bat. There is a, with the Zoom registration, there is a user record. And so that was, that was an easy solution. Um, how about if they're watching um, by the class on video, how do we know that they've done it? Well, it was, that was not that hard either. Um, it, we created a quiz and based on the information from the lecture, just about five questions, not a long one. And uh, also, and had thought of the idea of a little embedded thing, uh, not related to the lecture that was at the end of the lecture uh, that verified that the person had watched it rather than just going guessing or going on the information they already had. Um, yeah. And we'll show some examples of these embedded questions, but generally the questions that we embedded were relatable to the, the what the presenter had made. For example, if, if one presenter had said, my favorite plant is but didn't really focus on it during the presentation. We saw that as an opportunity to find out a little bit more about it and embed a question about that plant or that bug or that bee or something about the garden that they were talking about. So, okay. Um, is this so, you? I think yeah. so. So, here we are. We uh, had. Our, in October, we had our, our, our fall meeting of our membership voting that we were going to do uh, online version. 
of our classes that we were going to do one class each session. And then the question was, how do we make this happen? We knew that we could do Zoom because we had been doing in 2020, we had doing, been doing virtual plant clinics and, and offering those as our community service to the public all through the summer of 2020 to pretty, pretty good acclaim. So we had a lot of experience with Zoom and we knew exactly that we could use that platform. But then we had conversations with Devin and, Carol and Kathleen about the Canvas platform and had a couple of conversations with them, learning what the platform could do and made a board decision in November that we would adopt the Canvas platform and we would customize it for our class experience. So we made the decision in late November, 2020 to use Canvas and to use Zoom as our educational platform for 2021. Now our goal was, because our classes started in January, our goal was to enroll all students before the first class of January 13th. That class had already been set up as Karen mentioned by Karen and David and the, the other um, com committee members in training. And that mean, meant that we had to assign all students a new username and password by the December holiday so that in case there were any questions, we could call on the, the very good expertise of Devin so that we could solve those. That meant, if you look at the countdown, that meant by late November to mid-December, we had to get Canvas formatted and ready to go. So we also wanted to meet that before December holiday timeframe so that our users now who had username and password, if anybody's been trained on a new software platform, you don't wanna wait a month to be able to use a platform. Once you get your username, you wanna get into that platform and start poking around and playing with it. So that meant that we really needed to have the Canvas platform pretty well all completed before the first class and even before the December holiday when our students had their, their username. So our tasks, the go, 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 were to configure and format Canvas. We established organizing principles because as a, anybody who has used any kind of a, of a platform that's unfamiliar, we have a lot of non-tech savvy members in our 250 membership. Um, we wanted to make it easy for them to find all the materials. So we had established some organizing principles that we'll go over in a minute. We had to load all the materials. Then we had a beta test the Canvas model modules. And just to know what a beta test is, it's a, um, you, you get everything, you get your, your platform all done, and then you go out to some users that are relatively um, exemplary of your user base. That is not the people who have designed the system but rather users who may be not so tech savvy and find out what kinds of problems they have with Canvas and then you modify the system so that you address their, their concerns. And we enrolled our students in the middle, starting the middle of December and we created a welcoming homepage. That was became very important because we hadn't seen each other since March. So that was a very important aspect for us. Well, how do we do this enrollment process? The first was all of our members we felt would respond to a email from our extension agent, Adria Bordas. And we crafted for her a, an email that introduced Canvas as our 2021 learning platform. We alerted our users that they are going to need another username and ID and password and that that would be coming to them from an atypical address that they would not really recognize. So we asked them to not just um, ignore this VT address and not just leave it in spam or trash, but rather to open it because it would contain their enrollment link 
which they had to uh, do within seven days of that email. Otherwise it would expire and we would have to go through that whole enrollment process once again. So to help us, we enlisted the um, help of one of our IT administrators and a very talented gal who, who takes care of all of our um, user IDs for our SharePoint system. Um, and they, which is where we house our service hours and, and other documentation. But, and she did a batch upload of 20 users at a time. And it took a number of times to go through our 250 users. But again, our goal was to enroll most of our users before the Virginia Tech December holidays. So how'd we do? Well, we did okay. Most of our members were enrolled and logged into Canvas before the end of December. A few lingered on into January because they either were um, tied up with personal issues or were traveling. Uh, but only two out of our 250 were not able to enroll. One of those two is a octogenarian who elected to say, I'm not doing computers. I'm going to go to my neighbor who is also a master gardener and we two will sit together and take the classes and we'll just be a partner team. And we had another octogenarian who basically said, I'm an emeritus, I'm just going to sit this year out. I'm not going to mess with technology. Um, and otherwise we were able to enroll everyone. Now we did have some experiences where in spite of the fact that we had a pretty clear email coming from our extension agent, that email was deleted or ignored, and we needed to do a second Canvas enrollment. Um, one of the things about Canvas is that you cannot use a forwarding email. So for example, in my case, I have a forwarding email that uses my name and my husband's name that takes our Gmail accounts and our, we have another couple of, of emails, brings it together and sends it out as our Mason Perry Gene account. Um, Canvas doesn't like that. They want to go back to the Gmail or to the Yahoo or to the AOL or whatever you happen to have. So we had to make sure that we had the right email for a couple of our members. Um, and it, the, we found that if you had an existing Virginia Tech Canvas account, such as an alumni, you've been to Master Gardener College, you needed, a, you needed a different enrollment process than you had in just using the batch version of, of Canvas. But Devin was super helpful and, and got that all straightened out. So I mentioned the organizing principles for Canvas. Here we are, we're, we're now confronted with take it admit in the late November, we've got our Canvas, which is set up as in the format where we have all the chapters of our uh, Master Garden Handbook. That's the way Canvases comes set up, but that is inconsistent with the 11 classes that we had. So we had to format Canvas. Um, but before we started that, before we touched that, we had to set our expectations. So we wanted to have a home page that was very inclusive and telling people what exactly our educational approach was going to be, what they were going to need to do. There's pre-work and homework requirements that, that we had an outline that we put together of how each module was going to exist and how other information that they would wanna have on, on um, about Canvas. Karen and I talked about how all the materials will be held for each class. And we really strongly believe that we should put all the materials for each class in a single module so that we weren't going from one area to get the Zoom link and another area to get the class video and another area to see the class reading, that we wanted all of that grouped together. Um, the third principle that we had is that we wanted consistency. Um, there's nothing like having going into a, a strange room and knowing that your 
sink is over there and your refrigerator is over there and in every room you go into, it's kind of like the hotel approach, every room you go into, the bed's over there, the, the bathroom's over there and the TV's over here. And we wanted that same calming organization for our users because um, IT and this kind of a platform was not really, you, the, our users were not used to this. And we also, in that consistency, we also wanted to have all the materials presented in the same order. So you will see in a minute the, the order that we put things in because it's, it's, it's very calming and, and normalizing to have a strange thing like Canvas enter the world and yet know that you can enter the room and know where everything is. So our challenge starting in, the, in November was to format Canvas and load content. And that was within a month, that was a blistering speed. I encourage those of you who are thinking about using Canvas to take more time. Karen did a great job in putting all the information together. So it was readily handy. I wasn't looking for information, except in a few cases where we said, okay, we ought to have a little bit more here. She had done a great job in putting all the information. So that was a major reason why we were able to meet our month deadline, but I would not encourage you guys to do that. I would encourage you to take your time. So here's a, here's a little snapshot of our welcome page. You can see in the welcome page, we put a little video here because we hadn't seen everybody. So Karen, Karen, Adria, I, and David Yost had a little four minute video that was basically, hi, how are you? We're so glad to see you. Mm -hmm. um, and telling people a little bit about what they were going to have as an experience in Canvas. <clears throat> so the point here is that your homepage can be tailored so that you can embed videos, you can embed other content in your homepage. It doesn't need to stay the way that you get it off the shelf from, from Devon. So our homepage contained our welcoming video, the format for our training, the fact that we had homework that was required, information about how to use Canvas, information about how the cl each class module is going to be organized, and who to contact if you had a complaint or a superlative or you just wanted more information. It was all on the home page. The other thing you'll want to notice over here is that we worked with Devin to collapse all of the side, the left navigation so that for our user experience, we add home modules and announcements. And there's a lot of other materials that, that could be in your left navigation and we collapsed that, it's, it's still residing there in, in Canvas, but on the home page, we just didn't want people to be confused about where do I go now? So here's our class materials. And you'll notice that in our live class, we had the module name. So this is class one or class two, class three. We had our speaker information, our bio, and if they had any handouts or slides, we put them right onto that. We embedded the Zoom link. We had a unique Zoom link for every class so that we could do the class registration. We had the class pre-work and Karen is gonna go into that in, in just a minute. We had a number of options. We had the class homework that they were expected to do. And, we, and Karen's gonna go into this in a minute. And then we put in optional resources because we realized in our program, we not only allow the interns, we're training interns to grad for graduation, but the, because we have such unique um, presentations coming every year, we have a lot of um, certified master gardeners who have been through this 10, 15 years. And so we have a lot of presentations and other resources that we thought would be very helpful to them. For the video student, you'll see the handouts exactly the same. And what we did is we put the class video and quiz at the very top under the module, because when they're coming in, they're not coming into a live speaker, they're coming in to see the video. So we wanted to make that at the top. Do you wanna say anything more about this, Karen? No, no, that was clear. <laughs> okay. So 
we started each module, um, as I mentioned, with a class, and we found that over time, we needed to evolve. So we needed, we added a frequently asked questions because during our orientation session, there were a lot of questions about a lot of different topics. And we said, Karen and I were, <laughs> we must have gotten 20 emails a day. Like, what is this? What is that? What is this? And they were all pretty much the same. So we said, let's put a frequently asked questions module ahead of our class modules. And then we got a number of questions later on about how do we go for continuing education units? Where do we find those? What are the other educational opportunities? So people were thinking about these classes, but then also thinking, hey, there are other educational opportunities out there. Where do I find them? Now, these are links to our, our um, SharePoint site where we have that and to links to other places. So my point here is that Canvas can evolve. Don't think that when you start it up and you roll it out the door, you're done. You can really respond to the needs of your users and, and your students and it, it, it's flexible. It allows that upgrading as you go along without changing the, the overall structure of your system. So what are you, Karen? Oh, okay. Um, all right, so this is the decision to make the, uh, record the video was an easy one um, for the people who, had to miss the class for some reason. And some people um, on vacation, one of the things that those rules went out the window about missing two live classes because it was kind of absurd in this situation. So um, the Zoom class live, as Anne mentioned, um, had the registration, you had your uh, Zoom registration and it all went into a log and that was recorded by the user report. Um, the video um, upload, I think that took a bit of time for Ann. I You edited them, right? I Well, when you get a, a video off of Zoom, it's an MP4. And we had a lot of chatter in the front end, welcome, and, and then chatter in the back end, welcome, and bye. And it's been a long time since I've seen you. And for the... For the uh, it, for the class attendee, that was really great. But if you're looking at the video online and you're not present, that is really um, difficult. In addition, we had, some of our speakers had internet issues. We had one speaker whose um, internet went out for four minutes and that was just dead time. So we did do some spot editing to just make the video um, smooth and go along. Now that conversion process takes as long as the video um, takes to record. We then, we have a stream process in, in um, Fairfax County. So we uploaded the, the document, the video to our streaming service and then embedded the URL in Canvas. We were concerned each, the Canvas modules each have, um, the, our whole educational platform has 5.2 gigabytes of space. And we didn't really know how much uh, each of the videos were going to take. And when we got 11 videos, plus all the other educational videos, we didn't know whether we would run out of space. We, in retrospect, we haven't. I've looked at those uh, data, we haven't. We had plenty of room. But we didn't know at the beginning of all of this. So we chose to use our stream process and embed in Canvas the URL to that stream process. Um, so people had to use their Canvas ID as well as a SharePoint ID, but that's unique just to us. It's, you shouldn't worry about that. If you wanna upload your MP4 to, into Canvas, you know, work with Devin on that. Okay, so uh, after the, the people who missed watch the video, they would take uh, and submit the quiz. Uh, the quiz is was on, posted on Canvas as well. And we did it as quickly as we could. Anne rushed the video out as quickly yeah. as she could. And I wrote the quiz questions while I was taking notes. 
for myself and just mark down some ones that look like they would make good questions. And after um, some experiences with um, homemade quizzes that didn't work out as well, um, I understood why Canvas had taken out from their modules all the all the fill in the blanks kind because it was um, the speed grader is a handy tool and it um, doesn't it works best when the there's just one you know it's a multiple choice kind of question and we'll go through the speed grader in a minute oh okay. So we didn't really have a whole lot of people who missed classes. Uh, they, people seemed to make time for a one and a half hour Zoom. So there were only 10 to 33 people who missed the classes and had to watch the video. So that's a pretty good record. Yeah, and the, the 10, um, it, it, it depends upon each, what the content of each class and the timing of each class, but, but out of 237 students, I agree with Karen, that was pretty good. Okay, here is an example of a video student, Canvas Studio, video student quiz. We had a little trouble with that name. People were starting to take this quiz rather than the module quizzes. So we managed to identify it in a way that's clear. Um, so this was a question based on one of the lectures uh, on plant breeding and this um as the as it was in the canvas modules a lot of times when you make a, cor a false uh, a correct answer it, it doesn't give you any information but this one does um so the um, ann added was able to put put these questions online and make them usable in the same way as the quizzes that are already on Canvas. So that made it easy for people to understand how to do it. So we had a pattern where Karen would send me the questions. I would load up the questions in the Canvas module on quizzes. And the quizzes allows you to have a variety of different formats from um, yes, no, true, false, multiple choice, multiple answers, fill in the blank, uh, and we found, and just a edit answer, and we found that after some experience, we, we found that for the grading process, because we had so many people, that, that, that we, a couple of formats worked really best for us. So Karen worked to create questions in that format. Um, what I would do is I would load in all the questions, and then I would send a note to Karen to review it before we published it, once you, as a teacher, once you can, you put the information in and you can choose to publish or not publish. And sometimes Karen would say, well, change this or change that. And then I would change it and then publish it. Once you publish it, then people start taking the quiz and any changes after that are really, um, create a little difficulty for the user community. So we try to make sure we have everything right before we go to um, publishing. When you put in a quiz, you have uh, in the back end and a teacher view, you have the ability to say, do you want multiple chances to take the quiz or do you want it only once or do you want to have a, a time frame to quiz? Um, do you want to have an end date? Do you want to have a start date? So you can actually load your quizzes in and have your quizzes preloaded where they start after the class that you've given. And you can give an end date of a week, a day, a month, two months. So you can have a, a, you have a lot of flexibility working in the quiz um, module. And we decided um, not to have the to give people opportunities to retake them as often as they want, because I considered the quiz taking was actually a learning mode too. So, um, and, and several people did take them uh, multiple times. Okay, oh, here, here are the question that was the question of the week that Anne put at the end of the video. 
they were really fun. Uh, sometimes people didn't get the uh, get the point, and because maybe they didn't go all the way to the end. But um, the green metallic fly was uh, when we had the the speaker on native bees and the quiz of the week. The rattlesnake master was a wonderful plant that everybody noticed. That one most people got right. So they were fun. They were interesting questions and um, also verified that a person had watched it. Okay, so the self study idea was uh, the, what we really added to the, the, to the program. Um, there were choices. We wanted options for everyone, like the Master Gardener Manual. I have two copies and they're so scribbled up that you can hardly see them anymore. And that would be the case for a lot of people who've been uh, using the manual for class preparation in the past. Then we had the state modules that we, uh, we that was really the selling point for me to, to try this because I thought they, the ones that I looked at at the first were very well done and with the quizzes thrown in, it's something new, a new way of learn, a new way to learn, get information. And we were trying to get, add things that would round out the topic like for botany, well, not so much that one, um, like for the pollinator one, other kinds of things about insects. Um, you know, we're just trying to round it out because we are working with interns who haven't had as much, uh, many of the past lectures that are cover a lot of that. So, so you, the can, other, see, you yeah. can see on the right, an example of, I did a screenshot of, of what it looks like in the module. So here's your pre-work options. You can read the chapter on plant propagation, or you could do the two state modules on propagation, or you could look at a really great set of, oh, yeah. uh, set of, play, set of videos, but you had to look at all of the videos. So we, we because we're working with even though there may be gardeners and interns, they maybe have gardened for 30 years. So we had a variety of different life experiences as, as our users uh, approached the education process. And this is an example of the first slide on in the module for uh, botany. Um, it's, they were, what I liked about it was that there are, every part of it is illustrated. Um, and I thought that I thought they were very well done, especially for people who like, uh, who are visual learners. I thought, you know, it was a great opportunity to throw in a different uh, way to learn. There are a lot of those. They were really good. And they had little quizzes, little practice quizzes in after each one of these sections of the module and then a final uh, quiz at the end. Now, this was an idea that, um, well, I thought of it, but Anne is the one who really got it going in a nice form that continued throughout the whole year, the whole three months of um, using a way to use the information you've acquired, uh, maybe try a little something different other than taking a quiz. It was an option and um, we had a pretty good response, don't you think? I think that the people who took the opportunity to do the activity, it, what internalized and interpreted the educational information in an actualized way. In other words, it's not just book learning, it's it taking that learning and expressing it as an outcome in, in a way. So, so for example, this, ed, this particular example of vegetable and herb gardens, we asked uh, the, on class five, we asked 
them to plant a garden of vegetables, herbs, et cetera, include a layout and a plan for successive plantings. And we said, don't be constrained by your available land or light. Assume you have a raised planting bed of 20 by 20 with good light and soil. Um, we wanted people to really think about themselves as a purveyor of information to our client um, as well. But to the extent we could, we used a people to say in your yard or in your ideal yard or in a yard you've had or your neighbor's yard to try to make it more concrete. So we took the educational concepts and tried to make them more workable and concrete. And, and what we saw here was that you could upload the activity in the back end where you would, if you clicked on class activity, plant a garden, you would have this box come up. You would choose either a text or a file. And depending upon what you chose, you would upload your, your document. So for example, here are two samples from people who uploaded their response to that plant a vegetable garden. And you can see one is very hand, handwritten and one is very computer savvy, savvy where it's been done in some kind of, a, of a, an electronic program. Now, both of these also had text that got, went with it to describe what this diagram was. Um, and then we also just had for some of these activities, this is the class nine activity about um, identifying plants to achieve a pollinator friendly garden. They, we asked them to identify 12 plants in their yard and talk about, or 12 plants they wanted to put in their yard and talked about the pollinators that might come to those plants um, and talk about the, what those plants might be in terms of a host plant. So it was really trying to bring together a lot of information that they had. Um, and here are two examples of the text that people uh, put in. One just put in the text and one uploaded a document. So it was, it was a really uh, um, concrete way, an inventive way of trying to make their educational practice more pragmatic and more approachable to them. Okay. I, um, one of the other aspects of Canvas that you really learn to appreciate is the information it gives you back about the student activity. Um, this is in the people section. The names are gone, but the people section is on the teacher um, version. Um, you can look at many different ways of seeing how much use people have made of, the, of what you provided. Um, as you can see, we have um, one student, 224, out, that's 224 hours, 225 hours of being on the site and using what's there. And then there are others, one hour. Um, okay, so it was up to people. And this shows um, activities or quizzes. I didn't really use this to, to check for my purposes, but you can see that some people actually chose to do the activity and the, um, the quiz. The quizzes are green dots and the uh, red are the activities. Well, the, the red are the missing activities. What oh, they missing did, activities, they, sorry. They, they, so this, this student did two of the activities and oh, all of the quizzes. Oh, okay. And this student did none of the activities, yeah. but all of the quizzes. Okay. I just, see, I did not use that one. Okay. <laughs> and you can see, uh, you can follow across from the person's name, which is on the left of, uh, that you don't see, of what, um, their scores, kind of their average scores on the quizzes, what, um, what of the things they did do, um, how many submissions they made, we, and, and how many they didn't, pardon? Particularly how many pages they looked at. So yeah. we had a super user looking at 13, almost 1300 pages versus someone who looks at 27 pages. So you, as a teacher, you can gauge 
where your student is. Now recognize that we had certifieds and emeritus in addition to interns. So what we're not telling you is which of these are interns versus which one of these are either our emeritus members or our uh, certified members. But, but it just gauges the student interest in, in working on Canvas. Okay, the, um, this shows on the same line. It shows the uh, individual grades of, across the board for all of the quizzes. And um, that's kind of handy, even though we didn't, people were given a choice to either try again or just be okay with their grade. Um, it does show you uh, that. Some people, some of the groups might be wanting to have people do have a percentage passing grade. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, we were, had we just ex assumed that people were trying to to get the information and, and were taking the test. So each one of these rows is an individual student. Okay. Now speed speed grader um, is works with the, the Canvas quizzes really well. Um, it gives you the, you will get the grade in that information that you saw on the page. Uh, the only, the problem with uh, some of the quizzes that we made, they required um, a fill in the blanks and um, didn't always work as well. So I had to look at each of the submissions and I've tried to correct the answer if like this one didn't quite get the question, just add um, a comment to, and then you could, you could adjust the score. I mean, at the end, they gave good answers to the other one. So I, you could do a little, it says fudge points at the bottom and you can't really mm -hmm. see that. So, and then you just click after you do uh, sub, um, update score, then you push the submit and it goes into the record. So <laughs> this was the, this one always had to be graded by uh, me, but it was a, there weren't that many and it was a good chance to see what they got on the rest. It, uh, the bug pictured at the end of the video, I thought this was funny, a pill bugs ick. That was a correct answer. Um, Anne and Karen, I'm just going to make a note here. Unless Anne or Karen, unless you have another commitment that you need to get to right at 11, I think you should just keep going and go through the presentation. Okay. And then if anyone needs to leave, um, you know, right at 11 before they're finished and you have a question, if you put that in the chat, we'll address those at the end. And then this is being recorded. So We'll get the recording up and you can come back later. If anyone needs to leave right at 11, um, you can still ask your question. Just put it in the chat before you go. Thanks, Devin. Um, We're almost done. Yeah. Okay. So, the, here's, uh, so here's what we found is that the there was a question that allows you to have multiple answers. And we found that that was a difficult question for students to get correct because in Canvas, you had to, you couldn't, if there were three correct answers, you had to get all three answers in order for it to be correct. Um, so we found that this was a difficult question. So we tended to shy away from that one. Um, okay, this, oh, this one is an interesting graph. Did you make this, Anne, or did? This is, this comes from Canvas. This is oh. a overall, um, a submissions graph where you can look at your activities and you look at the quizzes and you can see in terms of your total population, you can see how many people took the activity questions versus the quizzes and recognize that our CMGs did not have to submit the activities or take the quizzes um, because that was an intern uh, requirement. So our interns are about 30% of our uh, of our overall classes. So we thought that this was a pretty good representation of our, of our population. 
but it's yeah. just a different way of campus allows you to have a different way of looking at at your activity well what we did find that a lot the a lot of the mass the certified master gardeners were very engaged in the whole thing and did some wonderful work and sometimes some took both the quiz and did the activity so all right what would we do differently okay well require all students to attend orientation that might be tough but we answered so many questions that were answered in or explained in orientation that it was actually a little bit annoying, but we had to understand that it was a new way of doing things, but it would have helped to have everyone attend that. And it was, all, it was an hour and a half. So, okay, and identify -ish students with IT issues before the classes began. Um, we didn't, and I, two classes into the program, I send, I called, actually sent emails to everyone who hadn't participated, trying to find out if they were having those issues. And there actually really only found one, I think one or two that were, that was the reason why they weren't attending. But it would be a good idea to get that, get, you know, make sure that they un know the whole thing. I don't know how, Ann, you probably have an idea. I do, yeah, but but it was, <laughs> we, we, we had a month, we had less than a month to get everything worked up. And so we really didn't have a good handle on students with IT issues. But those of you who are thinking about using Canvas and I would in, encourage you to do some sort of a um, survey of your student population so that you get a profile of who has IT issues. We had people who had devices that, that were, you know, that were ancient devices working on software systems that are no longer supported because they're so ancient. So it, I mean, we had a lot of IT issues and it's nice to identify those ahead of time because they do impact the class experience of that user um, with Canvas and Zoom for that matter, but it's, it's. Um... Okay, and the deadlines for class, for the class deliverables, that meaning the quizzes and the activities. Um, we did set some, some deadlines, but uh, we had, we had people who lagged behind for one reason or the other. And it was very, very, it, very hard to keep track of that many people that many units of information and get them all on a spreadsheet and into sh to our re record of uh, class participation of classroom hours. Um, it was doable, but it was hard. So you wanna, do you wanna do this one, Anne? Sure, so here we, we'll do it together. So here we have some suggestions for you all about our, our experience in a learning platform and working with Zoom is we thought a lot about how the students would approach, approach their coursework. And we designed our Canvas system with the student in, in mind. That was very successful. And, and that is a success story that we would like to pass on to you is, is that you don't need to design it as we did but if you think about your student and what you're hoping that they will get out of this educational experience and you know what that is ahead of time, then designing your Canvas system and approaching your Canvas Zoom or Canvas Teams or whatever combination of systems that you might have will, will be, you'll be, you know, plan ahead, you'll be much happier at the end of the day. And what we, what we learned is that we had, because of our experience set, I mean, we're, we're, um, we have some talented people on our side and that this is not their first round of working with um, platforms and not their first time in working on um, these, learn, these types of learning platforms or in working on um, uh, software programs, even though, for example, I'm a scientist, but I 
I participated in teams that have worked on designing software just developmental systems in the past to meet my needs as a scientist in terms of collecting data. Um, you may not have that kind of experience and therefore give yourself time to plan, to learn Canvas, to identify your material, to format Canvas, to load your content and to test the system with your actual user. Uh, we were able to truncate that because of the life experiences of, of Karen and I and others who, Yvonne and others who participated in the development of this, and you may not have that. So just because we did it in a month, I would never encourage anybody to do it that quickly. Um, we knew we could do it, but, but it was even for us a, a pretty huge challenge. And then over to you, Karen, on the grading. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, plan how you intend to grade students. Uh, oh, yes, that um, we sort of had a, a that plan, but it doesn't have to be your plan. That was our, we went by sort of the way we'd done it in the past. Our quizzes have been, you brought it, you did it, you brought it to class. We went over it in class. You sort of graded yourself. Um, the deadlines I already spoke about. I. It's probably your tradition and your and your group will be important in doing some of these things, and remedial reminders. I, for a large group, that's hard, and I sort of shouldn't. I shouldn't have waited so long because I there are a lot of people who were left with stuff. But we did send out a reminder of what was due and people had to read it and check on themselves. Um, that's one way to do it. It wasn't always that effective and I did end up phoning people at the end, so. Well, and we've already spoken about the tech savvy perspective yeah. in, in quite a depth. So how did we do? Um, the comments that we've gotten and these comments came in by chat, they came in on Canvas, they came in on verbally uh, we've identified so many here, and we'll we'll let you read this. But I, I'm going to go to the questions here, and, and the first one um, from Tamara is: Did you give the trainees a paper copy of the handbook, or did they download the online version? How much is the cost of your class? Um, we uh, we did not recruit any first year interns, so for our 2021 education process. So all of our interns and all of our CMGs had various levels, various versions of the Master Gardener Educational Handbook. Um, so we used a, the paper copy of that handbook. Now, Devin has available, if you want to purchase and add to Canvas, a, the electronic version. Um, we did not perhaps we should have, but we did not because everybody in the 2021 class had a version. Um, the cost of our class, our cost of our class is part of the membership of in our, our uh, we are a 501c3. So our membership is, we decided because we were not taking on any interns, we decided on a flat rate and I can't remember, Karen, was it 65 or $70, something like that for the year? Um, what was the method of trying to get, you know, the new trainees with all of your membership as part of the class? We have a mentorship program and we encourage the mentors to continue to work with their interns. Karen mentioned that earlier, um, so that the, the relationship would still continue between some of the certified and the interns as we were going through this. In addition, we had a lot of people who were struggling with uh, a variety of things. And we found that our Master Gardener community really just stepped up. If somebody was having a problem it, it, and they would put it in the chat, I'm having a problem with this, or I didn't get that, Master Gardeners just stepped up, reached out and, lended a hand across the, the platform. So in, in some case, you would see that this mark 
Um, I'm sorry, somebody, Simon here said that he made many more friends this year over Canvas than he had expected to because we weren't going hands on hands. So it's, I hope that that answers the question. I'm, Elaine asked, I must have misunderstood. I thought you said you decided to not have a new 2021 class and not a new intern. We didn't bring any interns in. Remember, we have a three-year internship process. So we bring in um, one third of our interns each year. So this year we had 75 interns and that really is two classes of interns, the um, 1919 and the 2020 class. We did not bring a 2021 class in. Um, but then you had all these training sessions. Could you explain again a related question I did understand is that interns are required to get 24 hours of service per year, so 72 before they achieve their MG status. Yes, that's right. We have 99 hours of education and 72 hours of service hours before we are certified. I don't think I answered your question, Elaine. Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself when we finish this and, and ask that again. Uh, once your course began, what was your time commitment as the operators behind the scene? <laughs> how, how different from <laughs> attending person to person sessions was the time commitment? Were there more than two of you working behind the scenes? You two are awesome. Thank you for the awesome Denise, Michelle. Um, this was a lot of work. We were creating processes uh, and, and doing the education, but I would say that once my job of, of helping Karen format Canvas, loading Canvas, um, my job in operations was really just to work the Zoom issues, and I have, I have people who help me with that, and who we, we do Zoom training for our, um, some of our folks so that they can, they are alternative hosts, um, which means that we can run, we have VT licenses and we can run the, the Zoom platform ourselves. But we also have a whole series of, I must have trained a hundred people on to be Zoom support people. And so we've got a lot of really talented people who do Zoom and who we rely on every class to do the Zoom support, let people in, mute, um, keep videos off so that we have the bandwidth when we have our classes. In our classes, we have about 150 people. So that's a lot to manage in a particular class. So we have lots of talent there. After we've loaded everything, my job was really to download the user information in Zoom and send that to Karen for her educational records and then convert the MP4 into a video that can be uploaded into Zoom, uh, uploaded into Canvas. And that doesn't require a lot of time. It, the, it requires some editing, but then the computer just runs, 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 runs. So I don't consider, because I could just walk away and let the computer buzz along. So that doesn't require a lot of time. But Karen, on your side, you have trained record keepers and um, you had done your your work effort was larger than mine. Oh, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> no. I think that the speed grading was really helpful to Karen. Yeah, it was. Okay. Uh, so were there more than really? There are some really good features. I'm sure it didn't use them all, but um, we didn't use them all. No, it's very. It, there's a lot there. It's more than. I needed, and it took a while to learn how to do it. I'm slow. Oh, hi, Tom. <laughs> um, Tom is one of our partners at Green Springs. When um, we get back to normal, will you continue all the online training or will we move to a blended training or an in-person training? Oh, Tom, we <laughs> want to go to in-person training, but there's so many things that we've learned from this um, online training and the use of Canvas. That, that David is really thinking 
maybe we'll have a blended session. What are you, what are you thinking, Karen? Well, he did mention that, and I thought his idea was great. He was talking about having online and then having workshops. I'm not quite sure what he's thinking, but that, I mean, it sounds like he's thinking some really hands-on kind of things, and I think that would be fabulous, but I don't know what his thinking is right now. I don't know what people will want to do. I don't know, do you think we're going to be able to go live in the fall? I mean, in this, in the, uh, when January comes around. Yeah, we don't know. It's all. We're ready though. We're, yeah, very we're ready. ready, we'd like to. Yeah. Hey, and you mentioned you had IT support. Are they paid or volunteer? We are all volunteer organization. We don't have any paid people, but because of where we live in Fairfax County and because of the job, um, that other people that our master gardeners have had in their lives. We have a, a really deep pool of talent. So for example, we have people who are teachers and are retired teachers from our county and public, public county and uh, private school, school system. So we have a lot of really great resources there. We have a lot of people who have worked in um, management and know how to, to pull all these things together. We have people who have worked in the IT departments in some of their um, organizations or in the school departments. So we've got a pretty deep bench of volunteers who are just terrific in sharing their time and talent with us and making um, this a success for us. I had a couple questions too. So it, it sounded like you have um, current Master Gardener volunteers are allowed to attend the speaker sessions for the trainings. Um, is that something that you also do in person, invite the current volunteers to attend? Yes, we are. That I think that's been going on for a long time. It's we have, a, we have a really wonderful meeting room that holds about 150 people at a time, a little squished in sometimes, but um, I, I didn't even know that other people didn't do that, that they only had their classes for interns. So, but um, I think the socializing part uh, where you talk to, you, you meet another, meet some of the ones who've had more experience and you learn there, you learn working with them at the plant clinics and the other activities. I like the way it's mixed. We, and we find that having the certifieds and the interns together really helps when you go to a plant clinic or whether you're, when you're doing Ready, Set, Go, or when you're doing some of the our other outreach programs, the community gardens or other things that we're doing. Um, because it allows you to know that person. Oh, I know you, I've seen you. Um, and it allows a lot of bonding in our, between our gardeners. I mean, we're, we're a social group. We are, I think all of our units are probably very social groups and gardeners love to talk plants and insects and diseases with each other. And that just creates a very vibrant and cohesive organization where we really share and we look out for each other's back. So having the CMGs and the interns together in a, the educational experience really helps us in our community service part of our jobs. Good answer. Um, it looks like Fern is asking if you have an association um, that meets monthly with to help with advanced continuing education during normal times. And then another question about if the current master gardeners attending the training classes get continuing education. Um, an association who meets monthly with advanced continuing education opportunities. Um, we, our our continuing education is on a list where, where I guess Karen and, and Adria 
post the educational opportunities on a continuing basis? I'm not sure I understand the question. Our board meets every other month. But other than that, um, I think we there's no regular meeting of operations committee. Karen, do you have a regular meeting of the training? No, committee? no. I just think a lot of it's word of mouth. Like um, I, I've gotten a questions about um, can I, how to, well, it came up with how do I put my continuing ed hours in. Um, Adria actually needs to, you need to find out if it's approved by Adria, the, our, our extension uh, chief. <laughs> um, the, but there are so many opportunities online and in the, you know, in the community and further around, around that can qualify and those would be in, we, uh, each person, each certified person enters those in their own um, continuing education hours if for it's an approved item. And we, we, um, we, in this Canvas, again, because we set up the Canvas system so quickly, we didn't make a, category for interns versus certifieds. I mean, that would be another thing I guess we should have put on the, our do differently list. Um, I think in retrospect and, and if, as we go forward, we will probably make two types of, of users within our student base. One is an intern and one is a CMG. Uh, because, you know, as I was reflecting on this last night, getting ready for this talk, we don't really, when we showed you those statistics, we don't really have an easy way at this point of separating out the interns from the certifieds. And I think that would be an improvement as we go forward. Yeah. Um, but we consider, because gardeners are always lifelong learners, we consider everybody students um but we but the interns are really our key user community that we were aiming for in our canvas experience but we are all lifelong learners so we we um so the word the question here is who is a student everybody is a student but we are really focused on the interns to get their educational hours i think Once we have um, the monitor. sorry if you wanted to do that, Tom, I think when you up when you upload your students or after they're uploaded, you would go in and change the section that they're in. So you could establish different sections for like current interns versus certified master gardeners. And then that would be useful also like for sending out announcements. You can designate your announcement only to go to people who are, you know, in the intern category. So if it's about deadlines or something. That would be a, that's a good idea, Tom. That would be a useful way to kind of organize people. Yeah, and, and I, I agree, Tom, because we just didn't have time. We weren't as familiar when we, with Canvas as we are now. So we just launched in um, and we, there's a lot that I think we would do differently next year that we've talked about, but that would be one area that, that I think that we would take our user community and divide it into interns and um, certifieds and we and we're planning on having new interns in 2022 we don't know how many yet um i had one last question which was how much time would you recommend people allow to you know start organizing their canvas course uploading the stuff before they actually want to start their training i would give i would have people it depends upon how you work, but I would have people take a three month time frame. Um, if you can learn from others who have used Canvas, then that's that's great because you know others' life experiences are helpful, um, and you can figure out where they made mistakes <laughs> and how to avoid those mistakes for yourself. Uh, so you can learn from others' experience. And working with others who are similar in educational profile to yours or similar in um, outcomes to yours is always really helpful to get ideas and brainstorm. Um, but I would think that having 
uh, organizational theme as we thought about when we had our system, how we wanted to put all the information into a class module that stood on itself. Everything was in that class module that you needed to go to that class. You didn't have to go hunting various places. That worked for us. It may not work for the way other units want to organize their system. But thinking through that process of what do you want the user experience to be like is really helpful. And then bouncing it off of people to see if that's really consistent with the way they would use the system is helpful. We didn't have the time to do that. We relied upon the life experiences of those of us who have been in that IT user community um, to, to just launch forward. But I think getting your user experience and input is really helpful. And that normally takes two to four weeks. And then, and then loading, identifying the materials and loading into Canvas and formatting Canvas. As I said, we did all of that in less than a month. Um, I would give yourselves more time because I will tell you that month was nonstop. That was all we did was we ate and we slept and we did Canvas. So, so that is not what I would hope that um, the rest of the world would, would do. Well, I had my, my time spent was finding things that I thought would fill the bill for rounding out the, each topic. And I think one day, just to find the video that I liked on pruning, I spent about maybe six hours. I watch, you know, watching the whole thing through, and uh, what you know, just try to find the one that would was the most attractive, actually, and get, had the information that I thought uh, was full full information. It, it takes a long time to do those things unless you already know where they are. So it was fun though. Um, well, we'll give, I'll just kind of sum up here, but if anyone else has other questions and would like to ask them, um, I really, Anne and Karen, I can't thank you enough for doing this presentation. This has been so helpful. I've taken some notes um, as well, and I'm trying to, I'm gonna go back through all of our documentation about Canvas to update it with some of your suggestions and kind of make it more thorough for those of you who are planning to use Canvas for fall or next spring training. And then we'll have to, I'll talk to Ann and Karen, but there are probably elements of the Fairfax, the way they've organized their course that we can incorporate into the template. So the way this works, if you actually want to use Canvas for your class is you just send an email to me, um, you know, make sure your agent is involved. And then we have a template course that comes preloaded with some material that I can give you as a starting point, And then you go through and customize. So I think some of Anne's and Karen's suggestions and ideas about things, um, maybe I can go back through and try and put those in the template. So maybe you can have some of those you know, to get started with as a starting point. Um, but that's kind of how the Canvas process works. If you're interested in starting, you know, if you want to look into it, it's not hard for me just to duplicate the course and give to you to start, you know, fooling around with it and see if it's going to work for you. So, and I think to go on what Ann and Karen said about the three month lead time, if it is something that you're interested in, um, email me sooner rather than later. So I can get you uh, set up with a course. Um, and then there are some other details that kind of we can work out as you start building your course out. Um, but I just think the Fairfax group has done a great job. They have this great team of volunteers and have put together um, really a good starting point that I think we can learn a lot from. So I just want to say thank you again um, to Ann and Karen. If anyone has questions about this, please feel free to email me. And this has been recorded, so I will get the recording up on um, the website and kind of um, you know, flesh out some of our documentation and then hopefully that will be available for everyone soon. Yeah, and though I would add to Devin, I mean, Devin was really helpful to us in getting some, some of the glitches that we couldn't understand. So she's a great, great resource for you all. Um, the one thing that we learned is there, there are um, tricks to adding new modules. There are tricks to figuring out the 
format of how you want to load materials. Um, we've made a, we made a number of mistakes, and I needed to go back and use a different template and use a different module and use a different um, page. Um, so if any, if we can help any of you, it you know give give some advice is, is how you might go about this. I know that Devin is a great resource, but if you need a, additional resources beyond Devin, just give us a call. We'll have, be glad to help. Yeah, and I can put you in touch with Anne and Karen too, if anyone needs their contact information. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. I'll try and have this recording up, um, if not today, then on Monday. Um, and thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Thanks.